Thank you, Daniel and Sebastian, for that wonderful music. And welcome, everyone. Lynn and I are thrilled that you have chosen to be here at the Vancouver Playhouse, or some of you are joining us online. Thanks for being here this evening. The public salon evolved from private salons. Dinners, Lynn and I hosted with diverse people sharing interesting ideas. Professor Abraham Rogatnik, our dear friend and mentor, he loved them and encouraged us to share them with the broader public. It was after he passed away that we acted on his request. His love of people, his love of ideas, his love of Vancouver are with us tonight. We dedicate this, our 36th public salon, to his memory. This evening, we focus on the work of the new global civic think tank and its efforts to address some important issues. The global civic think tank brings people and research and love of community together to find ways to make our province better. Global Civic has chosen four important topics to focus on. Tonight, we will hear about three, but I do want to share a few words on the other. That is the way we teach history. British Columbia is far from perfect. And there is much to regret in our history. It is important that young people are taught the negative things, but only negative things can lead them to a lack of confidence in their institutions, even in themselves. I challenged historians to help us tell a balanced story, to make sure the positive, the inspirational is also acknowledged to avoid presentism, that is, judging the past with the values of the present. For example, many young people don't know that our first governor was part black, was married to an Aboriginal woman, and they spoke Chinook jargon together. That's why Stephen Point, our first Indigenous Lieutenant Governor, he put a, erected a statue of James Douglas and hung a painting of his wife, Amelia, in Government House. We are thrilled that Stephen Point has recently agreed to work with our think tank. I challenged a historian to help us better appreciate our provincial institutions. He didn't answer with words, but with graphs. At the risk of getting too nerdy right away, I really want to show you what I think are the two most important graphs I've ever seen in my life. The first shows that the average income of humans for our first 200,000 years was about several hundred dollars per year. But just 200 years ago, average income went exponential. At the same time, child mortality dropped dramatically. Throughout history, on every continent, in every time period, 50% of newborns died in childhood. The glorious revolution in England created a new form of rule-based government that enabled stability, competition, innovation, free markets. It gave us the industrial revolution and unimagined prosperity. This new form of government is the same one we use in British Columbia. And it's an important reason why we have such prosperity and why 50% of us no longer die in childhood. We are going to continue to challenge historians to help bring balance and inspiration for our young people. The global civic think tank will thoroughly research topics, create public education materials, and develop innovative 
recommendations. We are seeking the wisdom of respected experts in, to help us better understand the three topics which are so important to the well-being of our province. Urban planning that is more responsive to market forces, the overdose crisis and the downtown east side, and supporting the voices of reconciliation. We are pleased that some of these outstanding citizens have agreed to speak this evening. Please text us any questions you might have for responses at the end. We do not edit. Their ideas are their own. We hope you will be entertained, educated, inspired, and even provoked. When housing becomes so expensive that young people are demoralized, their family formation is thwarted, our economy is harmed, and those at the bottom find themselves living on the street, well, we need a new approach. This problem has been getting worse for decades and seems beyond the capacity of our system to solve. We have two wonderful people to share their thoughts on our planning system. They disagree on many points, but I love that they really respect each other. Now, our first speaker. After studying economics at the University of California, Berkeley, the hotbed of student unrest in the US, he began teaching at UBC in 1968. He served as dean of the Sauter School at UBC. He chaired the Surrey City Development Corporation. And he is on the Canada Pension Board, the investment group that is responsible for all $300 billion of our pensions. So for five decades, he has warned governments that their decisions would cause house prices to dramatically escalate. Global Civic Think Tank believes it is time we listen to his advice. Please welcome Michael Goldberg. I have a little agenda. Sam asked me to uh, concoct that we might uh, attack at the uh, civic think tank. And uh, these are the issues I thought we'd take on. Housing affordability, uh, a small one. Uh, we rank, uh, we always pride ourselves on how outstanding Vancouver is. Here we rank as the third least affordable city in North America, so we're right at the top of the heap. Um, we also rank number two, according to TomTom, Tom, as being the second most congested city in North America. So again, we're in the top three. And both of those things need to be treated together. And while we're at it, we might as well look at the regional economy, which so far has been doing quite well and is closely linked to these other two. And then what we're doing this for, we're doing this so we can create an affordable and vital and enjoyable city, something we tend to forget about. Uh, I'm gonna put up two slides. Um, you'll note from both of them, after decades of teaching, I've perfected the skill of taking relatively simple ideas and making them unrecognizable. <laughs> These charts will prove that, and I'll try to pick them apart and make them simple. But they sum up what we need to do, and they give us some clues on how we can do it. So the first one, there's an inextricable link between the urban economy, urban housing, and urban transportation. Uh, transportation and land use are often said the different sides of the same coin. Uh, Land use supplies the demand for transportation, and transportation allows us to occupy different lands for different purposes. So when we look at this, we see that this is a system, and we have to treat any solutions as a system, that we can't just look at something isolated. 
we tend to forget that housing costs are not just the costs of housing occupation, it's also travel costs. So the two together, transportation costs and occupancy costs, are what constitutes housing. Given that we're number three in housing expense and number two in congestion, that doesn't augur very well for housing affordability and occupancy. It does mean, though, if we treat the two together, we can get some real benefits. So the current investments we're making in the Broadway line and the Broadway plan to significantly raise densities, I think will have a double-barreled effect of allowing us to lower the cost of occupancy and travel together and benefit the region. This one is even more complicated, but it's equally simple. What this says is we don't operate in a vacuum. Our urban system, housing, transportation, and the economy are a subsystem of a global system of cities and the global economy. And part of why we've been experienced the kind of housing price run-up we have is because we've had a very prosperous economy, lots of people moving in from the rest of the world and from the rest of Canada, and the people in BC have had rising wages. You put that together and it means house prices will go up unless we have at least as much supply coming on the market as we have demand rising. And that's not been the case. I like to paraphrase Bill Clinton who said in response to a reporter about why they were taking the economic actions they were and he said it's the economy stupid. Well I can paraphrase that for housing prices, it's supply stupid. Economics one says if prices rise it's either because there's not enough supply or there's too much demand or a combination of the two. You can't have rising prices if there's an excess of supply. So clearly there's not enough supply and we have to add to supply very significantly. And that's the simple message and I hope our new civic government in Vancouver is able to do that. Now all this has to take place in a system of governance. Uh, Sam will invite me back for another seven minutes to talk about that. But all of the levels of government matter and we're finally seeing the provincial government and the federal government saying we have a role to play and we can tweak the supply system at the local level if we seek to do so in a creative way. So I find that all to the good and we don't have a greatest government governance system for the region yet, but we'll talk about that future. So how do I close? To succeed and meet the housing challenges, we have to think in this set of systems, the global system and the urban subset. When we put it in that context, we see that we're facing uh, a huge run up in demand because of people moving in, because of a very strong economy, and the only thing we can do is find ways to add to supply. So we need to provide more and affordable housing choices, much more diversity. We have to think in terms of transportation and housing. We have to think of continuing to diversify the economy so more people can enjoy more prosperity in more kinds of jobs. And we need to provide excellent movement for people and goods both internally and internationally through the port and through YVR. And we also have to make sure that we have a resilient, enjoyable, and safe region in the face of inevitable change in climate. So thanks very much and appreciate you coming out on this wonderful Vancouver rainy day. Thank you, Michael. Our next guest is one of the most influential politicians in British Columbia history. He played a key role in creating the Robson Square and Law Courts, Whistler Village, Surrey City Centre, the Agricultural Land Reserve, and many other important developments of the province. There are so many ways he changed our province, too many to mention. But fortunately, he has recently published a book called 
using power well. It is a beautifully written document that gives us such fascinating insights into how our province became what it is. Please welcome Bob Williams. Thanks, Sam, and uh, thank you for doing this work, which is wonderful and worthwhile, and with the people that we have and your earlier work. Um, when I went to school at UBC, uh, I was quite interested in human ecology, but then I got involved in local politics and provincial politics and the opportunities there. And I've been blessed uh, to have lived this long and to have had the opportunity to do things in this magnificent province. So I'll talk about a few projects that I worked on that, and that some wonderful, uh, delightful people worked on as well and uh, then about uh, one project that I've noticed this year under the Parks Board that excites me and all the people that use it, and also the opportunity that our active uh, new people in the park staff are thinking about currently. And uh, it all excites me and uh, I think uh, makes us all doubly blessed. But first I'd like to talk about uh, when we got elected and Dave Barrett uh, and led a wonderful group that loved each other and uh, didn't worry about turf at all. Uh, the day after the election, I was down at Robson Square. At that time, it was the Alexander Ballroom. And uh, we'll have a slide now which shows what has happened there since slide one. And uh, if we can get it up. Uh, at any rate, I called Arthur and said, Arthur, we've got a job for you. We're going to junk the $10 million plan that uh, another architect had done, which W.A.C. Bennett had wanted. And uh, I had no authority. I wasn't just really nobody, except that I knew everybody in the Barrett government would trust me. I said, Arthur, you're hired. And he immediately then said, Bing Tom, you're hired. Bing was in Singapore at the time. And, uh, and so uh, that picture that you see now is Robson Square uh, during the uh, Olympics. Uh, it became the exciting center of the city. The other one was uh, Whistler. It, uh, uh, I got a letter from Al Rain, who's probably our greatest ski mine in Canada, and he was worried about logging on Black Cove Mountain, and he said, "It's the f thank you. That's uh, that's it there." Uh, and he said, "It's the future town center for Whistler, and it's this whole new mountain to be tied to Whistler." Uh, I was blown away by his capacity, as I continue to be, and uh, he uh, ended up becoming our ski coordinator for all of BC, and we created a resort municipality at Whistler, a special new ca category, and, uh, and we had a lot of fun. Um, he, uh, he has uh, since been invited with, by others, the Japanese investors, to come to Todd Mountain, which is now Sun Peaks, and is uh, now our second biggest resort in Canada. And uh, I noticed on television a while back, he was advertising, and now that he's got a convention center there, and noting that there were 25 restaurants in Sun Peaks, just out of Kamloops. It's an extraordinary town, as, as Nancy clearly is. So it was, it was good fun to get that opportunity to work with him. And he has many ideas about the future as well. So the present government has to start listening because uh, we, uh, we ignore our mountains. It's one of the great tragedies of all administrations in BC is that we've let forest sectors take over and just call it fiber. It's hard to believe that 95% of the province, our mountains, is seen as fiber, just fiber. But anyway, uh, that was good work and we had a lot of fun doing it. 
And uh, the next slide is, uh, is uh, out in Surrey. This is Old Wally. This is the magnificent Galleria that Bing Tom built uh, when I moved into ICBC and became chair. We had concluded that Wally was an important potential center, that the truth of our region is that it's always been two major towns, Westminster and Vancouver, but now it's Surrey, and this is central Surrey, and that is the center of that burgeoning municipality that has so many things that can still be done uh, and, uh, and could be done. Uh, and uh, so it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's transformed Surrey. And of course, Bing's beautiful work, uh, they actually thought was a bit much at the time. But the mayor, Bob Boves, said, you think it's too good for us? And uh, every, everybody slowed down and shut up. Uh, the next one is the main burden of my talk. And it's, uh, it's a little park that's called Rainbow Park. And it's just down the street here at Smythe and Richards. And there you get a real picture from the overview. It's the gorgeous work of a little group called Dialogue. And that's Eust Backer and his partner since grade nine, uh, Brady Dunlop, and two others, a landscaper and an engineer from uh, Edmonton. But you get a sense there, this tiny city park, you come in on one way on Smythe, and you see a, pro a bit of a promontory peeking out over the sidewalk, and it's part of a bridge system that's very intricate and that really cares about kids. So they can't get through the bars or fall down or anything. And they, they describe this little park as uh, three uh, porches. So they're kind of grouped in terms of, uh, of, of things. The other thing that I wanted to talk about that the parks is doing, the next slide is uh, the shoreline, next slide, uh, uh, the shoreline between Stanley Park and uh, Burrard Bridge. They want to redesign that whole shoreline. We will all be blessed when that five years of work is done and we transform our front door. Thanks very much. Next topic. Four people died today of a drug overdose. Four will likely die tomorrow and the next day adding to the list of over 10,000 preventable deaths. Half of them employed, most young dying alone. The overdose crisis and the downtown east side are related. As we speak, there are hundreds of people sleeping in the cold and the rain tonight. Many of them are in full-blown mental illness with serious physical ailments. We have three speakers tonight who all agree that we desperately need a new approach. We seem unable to solve this problem. The global civic think tank is committed to finding a way to end this scourge. The next presentation has photos taken by antiquarian Robert McNutt. Our next speaker was the City of Vancouver's homelessness, homelessness advocate. She clearly didn't understand what was expected of her as she insisted on talking with actual homeless people where they were. Others thought she should stay in the office. They said if she wanted to speak with homeless people, she would have to do that on her own time. So she worked at the city by day and walk through the alleys, meeting and helping people by night. I remember city councillors would call her St. Judy. They were dead serious. Hundreds of people owe their well-being and even their lives to her. Please welcome Judy Graves.
I want to talk to you about the downtown east side tonight. Now, you see a lot of homeless people in the pictures that we took. Um, most of these pictures were taken by my friend Robert McNutt, who I think is here tonight. Um, the downtown east side has been occupied since the first sunrise. And it was occupied not by people living in cheap synthetic tents. It was occupied not in constant chaos. It was occupied by a nation of very wise people who lived in long cedar houses with their extended families and went camping in the summer. It was occupied by people with a highly structured society and it was occupied in great happiness. In the pictures that we're showing tonight, you'll see no happiness. You see no structured society. You see no long cedar houses you see no extended family. Homelessness came with colonialism. Homelessness has been a struggle off and on with the city of Vancouver since before the Great Fire. And you know, by the 1980s, we pretty much aced it. So anybody here who is over 60, show of hands, you'll remember when you'd go downtown, you'd never see anybody on Robson Street sleeping out. You wouldn't see people huddled against the bay at night. You would not see people panhandling all over the city. Um, what happened? Right? Well, when we remember the 1980s, we remember that Vancouver was covered with tiny Victorian houses, multi small rooms inside them, and you couldn't go down a block anywhere in Vancouver without seeing two room for rent signs. And the rooms rented for about one quarter of minimum wage. So everybody was housed. If you got in trouble with your landlady, you walked down the block and you'd rent another room. It was all fine. And then in the 1990s, the federal government cut funding for subsidized housing. And that meant that as our city grew, people displaced into cheaper and cheaper housing, but there was less cheap housing to displace into. After the expo, um, the price of land shot up and running a rooming house was no longer the best economic use of those rooms. And so people were evicted and that's when we began to see homelessness. The houses were either gentrified or torn down to build um, apartment buildings. And there was no more place for people to live inside. The process took about 10 years, um, but by the year 2000, it was virtually impossible to find affordable housing for someone who was on minimum wage or who was on um, welfare or disability benefits anywhere in the city of Vancouver with the exception of the downtown east side. And at that time, the buildings which were about one third tenanted began to fill up. Within 10 years, it was hard to find five rooms to rent. Um, 
in the whole downtown east side. Uh, it, and because there was nothing to rent, we began to find more and more and more people living outside. In the year 2000, in the downtown east side, surrounding Woodwards, we had our first tent city. You remember Wood Squat? And from the downtown east side, it's the, the tent cities stretched out, up Canby, over into Strathcona, um, a little bit further east onto the waterfront, one after another. And people just continue to have been displaced. So what we're seeing in these pictures is the so-called tent city that has developed along East Hastings. The pictures were taken from about the first week of May through, I think, the first week of October as the um, tents ebbed and flowed as the criminal activity built as the um, police took guns, as there was an incident with a crossbow. These are not things that are associated with homelessness. This is a complete lawlessness. This is a gang involvement. And what is the solution? Along Hastings, we'll see uh, among the chop shops, some of the most vulnerable people in Vancouver actually living soaking wet tonight in tents. They need protection. There is no compassion in leaving people out on the street. What do we need to do? We need to bring virtually everybody who is homeless in, get them inside, get them sheltered, and then house them. A city can't live like this. We need to return to the origins of Vancouver. Thank you, Judy, for the decades of work you've done for people who are suffering. Our next speaker is a medical doctor who dealt with an addiction, who dealt with people with addictions in Halifax, working for the Canadian Navy. Now he runs an innovative addiction service that works only with the most severe cases. Despite this, not one of his patients has died of an overdose. And he and his team have helped them achieve a remarkably high quality of life. People come from around the world to see what he does. Please welcome Dr. Scott McDonald. Thank you, Sam, for that kind uh, introduction. And I'm very grateful to the opportunity uh, uh, to be here. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of acknowledgments. Uh, I want to th thank the staff at, at Crosstown Clinic, uh, the nurses and uh, clinic workers who were there t tonight just down uh, Hastings Street pr providing supervision and support uh, and prescription heroin, diacetylmorphine, uh, to the participants in our, our study. Uh, the patients who are there today, to the research team, uh, and particularly uh, Eugenia Yuberiokas, professor in the School of Population and Public Health uh, at, at UBC. Uh, I'd like to start by talking about another think tank, the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., uh, which uh, invited me to sp speak to them uh, se several years ago. Uh, they're a uh, uh, Republican uh, uh, think tank, and they support prescription heroin, uh, and they've come to a, dis uh, a position that policymakers are currently stuck in a state of denial about the true cause of uh, the, the overdose crisis, because it, it's not opioids, it's prohibition. 
Uh, and uh, here's an example of some of the evidence here in North America. You know, the, the problem of a toxic drug supply is not yet addressed. Uh, and the prescription of opioids is, is, uh, is reduced, yet the number of deaths continue to, uh, uh, to, to surge. So uh, uh, it, it, it isn't opioids and it's not prescribing. It, it's something else. How, how did we get to prescription heroin and the clinic that I have and the small number of pilot programs that are, that are here in BC? Well, opioid use disorder is a, uh, is a chronic medical condition. Uh, we've got good, good treatments in methadone and suboxone, the standard treatments, but they don't work for everybody and they don't work all the time. Uh, and there's emerging evidence from our, our, our studies here in Canada, but mostly in, in Europe, Switzerland, uh, the, the Netherlands, uh, that have been providing sp prescription heroin for uh, many, many years, particularly starting in the UK. The UK, the United Kingdom is providing prescription heroin to a few hundred people for nearly a century. Uh, and uh, people go to a pharmacy, pick up powdered uh, diacetylmorphine, they take it home and uh, self-administer uh, uh, in the comfort of their homes, go back to the pharmacy in a week. The, the Swiss looked at that in the early uh, 90s, late 80s, knowing that they had a problem with uh, uh, open dr drug use and, and people dying, and they said, well, we don't quite like that UK model. Let's do something supervised. Methadone is good, but it doesn't work for everybody. We're pragmatic. Let's deal with this, and we'll provide syringes in a supervised fashion. Uh, very quickly, the problem got better, and people in North America, researchers said, this is something we need to explore in North America. And that led to the Naomi study, it asked the question, is prescription heroin, diacetylmorphine, superior to methadone in that population that continues to inject despite attempts at methadone? And yes, it is. Published in the New England Journal of, of Medicine in 2009. The study ran from 2004 until 2008. Uh, New England Journal, respected journal. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to transition to a program at that time, but Denmark looked at those results and said, we don't need to know about these studies. We're going to expand prescription heroin. And that initial rollout in 2010 was so successful, it's now integrated into the healthcare system uh, in, uh, in Denmark. Uh, we didn't get a program then, but it led to our follow-up study, Salome, uh, which asked the question, is hydromorphone a licensed uh, analgesic if it's as good as diacetylmorphine? Uh, we were worried that we'd never get access to diacetylmorphine because it's, oh, it's, it's too controversial. Uh, but it's not, it's just an evidence-based tool in the toolkit, another option for care. And we now have a licensed producer here in, in Canada. Diacetylmorphine is available to any jurisdiction or, prov or province that might want to, to access it. Uh, diacetylmorphine is more effective than methadone in that population that continues to uh, in inject. Uh, it also reduces societal costs over a lifetime, but $140,000 in saving rather, rather than continuing the standard treatments. And for policymakers, it also reduces crime. So in Denmark and uh, Switzerland, the prescription heroin was not expanded because it was better care. It wasn't expanded because it reduces mortality and uh, assists people's lives. It's been expanded because it, re it improves public safety, reduces public disorder. Uh, and my most recidivist patient at Crosstown had been in and out of jail over 200 times. And since he's been in our program, he's not been back to jail. That's, that's, just one, that's just one example. So uh, how do we close that care, care gap? We've got, we've got good options on the recovery, abstinence side of the continuum, but uh, there's thousands of people that uh, are, aren't ready for that option yet. And uh, we need to normalize uh, options like prescription heroin. We need to offer it in a patient-centered uh, way. Uh, if somebody was looking for uh, a safe opioid high, I need to have a tool in my toolkit that can meet them where they are at. And as a prescriber, I might see that as improving their function. 
and we need to have outcomes that are geared towards patients and what, what they are seeking, patients and families, not just abstinence as an, as an outcome measure. Uh, the, the, the models are out there. There are countries like Netherlands, Switzerland, who've integrated this kind of approach into the healthcare system. Uh, there's probably 100,000 people in BC who would meet the criteria for opioid use disorder, and there's probably a, a, a few thousand, 10,000, 12,000, who, who might need this kind of a treatment. Uh, we need more approaches. We need more tools in the toolkit. The, the options and the, the approaches we need to take, the models already exist. Uh, let's make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for your innovative work. Our next guest is a clinical psychologist at Simon Fraser University that has focused his life around an academically rigorous approach to homelessness, mental illness, and addictions. He is a strong critic of our current approach, and many are beginning to look at his ideas as the way forward. We are grateful he has taken the time to be here tonight and that he is advising our think tank. Please welcome Professor Julian Summers. Thank you, Sam and uh, Lynn, for the invitation to join this wonderful uh, tradition. And thanks, all of you, for uh, making discussion possible and uh, the chance for all of us to change our minds together. Um, uh, BC has the highest prevalence of both suicide and drug poisonings in Canada. And together, these are referred to as deaths of despair. I'm going to summarize um, evidence, very high quality evidence, um, that um, describes the transformation from despair to wellness. Deaths are the proverbial tip of an iceberg. Less visible is the proportion of BC's prison population that had been diagnosed with addictions, mental illnesses, or very often both prior to incarceration, which rose from 50% to over 70% in less than a decade. Over the same period, involuntary hospitalizations for addictions and mental illnesses separately more than doubled in BC. And in the past year alone, deaths among people experiencing homelessness increased 75%, primarily due to addiction. Here is a disembodied uh, list um, of characteristics of people that my colleagues and I have worked with uh, intimately over the last 30 years um, in, our, in our work addressing and responding to people who experience homelessness, addiction, and mental illness. The, the numbers say more about the um, abysmal uh, performance of our public service than they do about the people affected. The list also fails to ref reflect the pervasiveness of abuse and neglect among the, the people described and the absence of supportive caregivers, uh, usually throughout their lives. Over 25% were in foster care. Uh, not that all foster care um, is bad. Um, I've adopted a guy myself with three sets of parents. 25% had children under the age of 18 when we met them. Their major goals included resuming paid work, overcoming their addictions, and reconnecting with children or other family members. The failure of the war on drugs teaches us that addiction cannot be affected by disrupting the supply of drugs. Instead, we need to address the conditions that create demand for drugs, which include unemployment, homelessness, and lack of meaning in life. Randomized trials conducted in Vancouver and internationally demonstrate the effectiveness of structured interventions known as recovery-oriented housing, sometimes referred to as housing first, that promote choice and social reintegration among people deemed the hardest to house. Results in Vancouver from randomized trials showed a 71% reduction in crime and a 50% reduction in medical emergencies in the first year 
of our intervention. By contrast, rates of crime and medical emergencies among people randomized to receive housing and support altogether in a single building were no different or were not significantly different than the rates among people who remained homeless. Our clients credited their neighbors with their renewed sense of feeling normal. Their sense of dignity and value increased as they experienced being responsible for their own choices rather than having decisions made for them. Recovering wellness should be expected, and when it doesn't occur, the fault lies with the approach we're using, not with the people we're trying to help. The Stanford Lancet Commission recently analyzed the crisis of poisonings in Canada and the US. The very policies they singled out for skepticism, trying to create an alternative pharmaceutical supply of drugs, installing vending machines to dispense drugs and paraphernalia, happen to be at the top of BC's current agenda. And the beneficiaries are people connected to the current government, former public officials who now own drug companies, and those running large SROs with the highest concentrations of death. Requiring the public to fund addictive drugs in neighborhoods around BC while ignoring the causes of addiction is recklessly dangerous and demonstrates the current government either doesn't get it, doesn't care, or both. When government leaders were advised that BC has one of the world's best information systems for measuring the performance of interventions, addressing homelessness, crime, despair, and mental illness, they responded within a week by ordering SFU to destroy the database. Provincial audits reveal the absence of basic business practices associated with public spending on housing and other services for people living in perpetual crisis. When professionals such as BC public servants, physicians, lawyers, nurses, or airline pilots develop addictions, they are offered highly effective recovery-oriented treatment. But when people who are impoverished develop addictions, they are provided exclusively with drugs and none of the resources that promote wellness and recovery. The government claims that poisonings disproportionately involve construction workers when fully two-thirds of people who experienced poisonings in BC were not only unemployed in the year of their poisoning, most in the previous four years, according to T4 Income. The government also claims that legalizing drug possession will cause the decriminalization of drug users, but out of 70,000 offenses among British Columbians diagnosed with opioid dependence, drug possession accounted for only 3.8%. Most offenses involved theft associated with survival, and about 10% were associated with violence due to the chaos they're forced to live in. We can only decriminalize drug users by preventing those forms of crime. Here is one attempt to stimulate positive change in BC, developed over 18 months with a network of collaborators. Our recommendations are based on results of randomized trials that cost Canadians $120 million to conduct and learn from. We combined that evidence with evidence of where the needs for the same service are greatest in the province. I warmly encourage each of you to review our proposal and the associated three-year budget. The proposal was submitted to David Eby last year to resounding silence. I, I believe improvement will require a new government, one committed to providing everyone with equal access to wellness, with clearly articulated plans based on evidence. We must insist on better. Dramatic improvements are needed and are achievable, and by working together, all of us will be elevated, most of all, those currently living in despair. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for the important caveats and the important uh, conditions and thoughts that we need to uh, process when we sort through this and recommend some things for, for government. Our society is at a moment of great opportunity to make right many great wrongs. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was indigenous-led and generated 94 calls to action. Reconciliation, which is linked to UNDRIP, the United Nations Initiative, is a positive message to bring people together 
where indigenous people take control of their destiny and achieve economic independence and prosperity. It is challenged by other approaches like decolonization, which differs in important ways. How can Global Civic support reconciliation and the leaders who are transforming First Nation communities? Our region transforming our province and making it more prosperous for all of us. We have two leaders tonight who have both taken different approaches, but both fundamentally changed our province in profound ways. Our first speaker on this topic is a hereditary chief with the Squamish First Nation. He was one of the few who saw the 2010 Olympic Games as an opportunity for his people that he could not miss. He initiated the first meetings that led to the four host First Nations. We went together to Torino in 2006 to welcome the world. He also played a key role in facilitating the remarkable Sinoc development and the MST Corporation in which Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh are engaged in real estate development worth around $20 billion. This has turned them from dependence into becoming city builders, creating much needed housing for everyone. Our next speaker is, is he's helping youth take charge of their lives and see a great future for themselves. And his passion right now is called Back to the Fire, to document the elders that have made all of this possible so young people don't lose track of the values that motivated them. Please welcome Chief Gibby Jacob. Thank you, Sam, <clears throat> and thank you, Lynn, for the invitation to be here. I came on uh, pretty late, I think we've, maybe three, four weeks ago, Sam and I were talking about this, and uh, he invited me to come on, and uh, I'm happy to be here. And uh, my ancestral name is Cockleton. I'm one of the hereditary chiefs of the Squamish Nation, have been so since 1999. Unfortunately, my sister passed, who was a chief before me. So my family uh, chose me to, to take over the position. And uh, I didn't think I'd get it because I'm the youngest of all of our family, my siblings. Uh, I would introduce my, my beautiful bride of 46 years, Vivian Makwa Oth. Uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for her in her steadfast support and uh, you know I always appreciate and love you for it, my dear. I'm going to uh, go through a couple of slides. This is my uh, late mother, late father. The home you see behind is uh, the old wartime homes that uh, housed the uh, armed forces people. And our people were offered the opportunity to purchase these at $2,000 per. So there was several that were uh, purchased. This is my late sister's home. It's a couple of my uh, nephews. That's my house, the little one behind there was a little pink house. And that's the last pink house I ever lived in. <laughs> There you see it. <laughs> but in the day, back in the day, in the 50s, 60s, you know, there was not too many people who lived on our reserve. Can you say that? Yeah, pretty close. <laughs> but uh, the Anglo name for it is Capilano. And uh, now we have, you see it going over Lionsgate Bridge, just the hundreds of homes that we've built over the last couple of decades for our people and we still have over a thousand on the waiting list for houses so I want to emphasize that it's part of our reconciliation to our people 
to ensure that we are getting the resources necessary to fill those needs. I was happy to see one of my uh, cousins and one of my mentors and uh, one of the most brilliant men I know, Harold Cal. I don't know where you're sitting at, but uh, he's the head of the Financial Management Board and uh, they've done spectacular work in this country for everybody, for everybody. Here you can see we, uh, part of my work with Andy Keen, where are you Andy over there? That uh, we're doing the documentary as Sam had mentioned and uh, we, the, the drone was flown over the new section down in Capilano. I think there's another 75 homes that are being, the services are going in for that. Gets me dizzy watching that. <laughs> but we uh, supply 80% of the revenue that goes in to build each and every home. The other 19,000 comes from the federal government, but the federal government does put in the money for the capital and infrastructure for the housing projects. We're pretty proud. Uh, of this and uh, the next speaker, uh, Ellis Ross, uh, MLA. The provincial government put in some funding, you know, to help alleviate some of the housing for our very low income people. So Ellis, I want to let you know that our people truly appreciate that. Thank you. And as you can see me sitting in the middle of the canoe, no paddle. <laughs> I just told those guys, I'm gonna chief the heck out of you guys paddle. <laughs> this is when uh, the flame hit uh, Sydney and uh, the armed forces and the rest of the folks, uh, the, the people who were looking after the flame, they brought it to uh, a dock in uh, Victoria and we took it from there to, uh, to the parliament house. <clears throat> so that was pretty, uh, pretty spectacular, you know, being a part of that uh, particular piece. St. Paul's Indian Residential School, you know, it was a school that was in North Vancouver. It was a Catholic uh, residential school. Many of our people, over the decades attended that school. I myself attended, but uh, I was a day scholar, so I was allowed to go home after the day was done at school. Thank God, you know. I really uh, feel good that, you know, I didn't have to be separated from my mom and dad and the rest of my family. When they took our people you know, and especially the older ones. You know, my late father, my sister's here, Sharon, where are you? Our late father, he was raised by his grandfather. Every morning, he'd have to get up and go for a shokwam. And that's a bath. And they used cedar boughs to brush themselves off every morning. If the river was frozen, they'd have to bring something to break a hole in the ice to get in there. And you want to tell me you want to try that? The polar bears do, I guess. But so, anyways, uh, after uh, him and his cousins and his bro baby brother went went through that, <clears throat> they'd go back to the longhouse. They'd dry up, warm up, have breakfast, and my great grandfather would sit him around the fire. And give them all the teachings that he thought that would be necessary for them to move through their life the traditional way. So that was that was really important to the to our people because that's who we are. You know, it didn't change over the centuries. That's who we were. But it changed when they start taking our people to residential school. They broke the circle. They broke the circle of how, what, and who taught our people what. 
We didn't need trigonometry. We didn't need science. We didn't need French. We didn't need a lot of that stuff because that was, you know, really not in who we were. <clears throat> I wrote myself a bunch of notes. I'm not used to doing this. I don't never ever have been just down for seven minutes. <laughs> so I tell him you can't boss a chief around, you know. <laughs> Except my wife, that is. <laughs> she says, You're the chief out there, you're over here, you're me, my chief. So the traditional ways, you know, were, were really missed by a lot of generations of our people. I, I was a department head in my nation and one of the things we did on Amalgamation Day when all our tribes joined together in 1923, asked questions of the children because they had to, we were giving gifts away. So they had to get a stamp every booth to prove that they had they'd been there. So we'd ask the little kids, well, what village are you from? Oh, I'm from Capilano. That's not the name of your village. That's the name of one of our ancestors, Kayapalano. Kayapalano, say that, Kayapalano. So they said that. I said, Capilano is an English version of Kayapalano, just the same as Chatzalano, Kitzalano, same thing. So I thought, well, what's going on here? You know, why don't the kids know this? And I was getting kind of perturbed. Then I thought about it. The two to three generations in front of them never got those teachings, never got those place names instilled in them like the times of our late, late ancestors. So as Andy, or, Sam had mentioned uh, Back to the Fire. That's uh, my and my team's uh, efforts to close that circle, bring back uh, as many teachings from different leaders in this province who are willing to share what they went through in their lives. The first one is Chief Robert Joseph. Probably most of you might have heard of him. But he's our first, I call him friends, I don't call him interviewees. They're my friends who are going to be part of participating in this. So we're probably another week, two weeks away, Andy, having it completed. Then we'll be looking for a place to launch it, maybe uh, with Elon Musk. No. <laughs> he launches everything. <laughs> so, get my... The present day uh, is spectacular for many reasons, and the many reasons are our people are not invisible nor in traditional territory anymore. That was when Oka went on. I don't know if many of you remember that. It was a pretty acrimonious time between Canada and the Mohawks. And uh, we have a huge population of children going to school at the time, and still today as well, but we're worried about those children's well-being, you know, having to travel off reserve to go to a school. So we held a, a two-day, two-evening event, and invited people. We didn't block the bridge, Lionsgate. We handed out pamphlets inviting people Anyways, I got a lot more to say, but my time is up, and I knew it. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I'll be around uh, if you want to ask any questions or anything. Uh, we'll be around for a while after. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chief. Uh, if you hang around with Gibby much, you will learn about Gibbyisms, and he... Uh, you know, he'll say, oh, I'm a 1951 model, shocks don't work, the brakes don't work, upholstery is a little messy, but, uh, you know, he, he's got all of these little sayings, I always want to write everything down.
So, Our final speaker tonight has come a long way to be with here this evening. As a chief counselor with the Heisla First Nation, he catalyzed one of the largest private infrastructure projects in Canadian history with liquid natural gas. He has revolutionized the lives of the young people and opened the doors for economic self-reliance and personal achievement. He has worked with First Nation Indian bands across Northern British Columbia so they can take control of their own destinies and give their young people hope for a dignified and prosperous future. Please welcome Ellis Ross. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, and it, every presentation here was great. And I could see myself and my history in every one of those presentations, whether you were talking about housing or addictions. And my wife here is with us tonight. Her name is Tracy. And we both come from pretty humble beginnings, uh, very poor on reserve, uh, in a very poor reserve. And we still live there today with our children and grandchildren. Today's different. It's a turnaround. Uh, we don't talk about poverty anymore. We don't talk about the Indian Act. We don't talk about welfare. We don't talk about any of that. Because basically, the, over the a span of 10 years, we went from one of the poorest First Nations of BC to one of the wealthiest. And wealth meaning money, land, infrastructure, everything everybody else takes for granted in Canada. But in all those years of celebrations, we'd, we'd celebrate a community celebration every time we accomplished something because it meant us being included in the economy and society of BC. But at every celebration, I think, what am I doing here? There's got to be a larger reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's great that we're getting all the success, but at the end of the day, there's got to be a higher cause. Because at the end of the day, I'm not a politician. I never even wanted to be a leader. I just kind of stumbled into it by accident. So over the years, I've tried to think about the higher cause. And tonight's the first opportunity to, to kind of present what I think about why I do what I do. So you're, you'll be the first to hear my thoughts on this. And forgive me, but I had to write this down because it's hard to condense this into, into seven minutes given the entire history of my band in, in the, from 2004 to today. As a First Nations leader, it took me a while to realize that the narrative I followed wasn't going to achieve what I wanted for my people. The words used to describe our state of dependence and poverty were the Indian Act, paternalism, and closing the standard of living gap. These were issues that could be resolved given bold leadership and visionary decision making. Today, these words have been replaced with political words that have no realistic solutions. Words like colonialism, unseated, or now the heavily politicized word reconciliation. Words that are not actionable are just words. For myself, I slowly changed my approach after listening to my people who wanted to end our dependence for themselves and for their kids, end poverty, and wanted the ability to address our own issues on our own terms. It was summarized by my late uncle Heber Maitland, who simply said, we want to share and a say. The courts of Canada agreed with this concept when laying out the responsibility of the Crown when dealing with the infringements of Aboriginal rights and title, which is actually included in the Constitution of Canada. Make no mistake, changing our approach is what brought success to my band and to our people. Is money a measurement? Yes, money is a measurement of that success, but it is only one component of a long-term solution. Because in the Indian Act world, money is a measurement because most First Nations have no control over the money that comes from Ottawa, hence the word dependence. For myself, I had to depart from my anti-resource development, anti-government, and yes, my anti-white 
views because that's what I, I was taught growing up. As a First Nations leader, I looked in the mirror and realized that to change our outcomes, I had to admit that our governance system was not designed to achieve success. It was not designed to manage success. That our government system was designed to deal with the Indian Act instead of how to deal with government and industry. Many leaders characterize this as managing poverty and how they're tired of it. I also realized that we needed full transparency and accountability if we wanted to take our people down a new path. And that successful outcomes often meant concession. 100% winning meant everybody loses at the end of the day. And that to change the status quo, we had to clearly define what it is what we wanted and then make determined decisions to achieve what we wanted. Two very different processes, painful to, to boot because you're trying to change mentalities and narratives that are deeply ingrained. Over the years, I came to understand this at a higher level. So I decided and came to understand that if we want a strong society, we need strong individuals and strong communities under the umbrella of a strong province and a strong country and vice versa for that matter. This is what I strive for, even more so today because that's all connected. We're all connected. In some form or fashion, we've all experienced what I'm talking about here whether we're talking about addictions, poverty. If we haven't done it, our ancestors did it. Today, if I was to guess at how close my band was come to achieving these independence goals on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd say we'd score a 7. And for our First Nations community, I'm incredibly proud of that. I'm especially proud of that because I was taught to be a hard-working, independent, honest person by parents who went to residential school. And no, they were not taken. They were sent by their parents, mainly because of poverty issues. Which takes us to what I see in BC today. In terms of where our society is going and where our province is heading, and our, our apathy, our indifference, or, they are, or dare I say our ignorance, is leading us to where I was before, back in 2004, which is the wretched state of dependence. I can't help but observe that as a province, we are dependent on other jurisdictions for manufacturing or fuels. What's worse is, I see us repressing our economy. And it's inev inevitable that we become de dependent on government programs and our provincial government then becomes more dependent on federal monies. And as I said before in my previous experience, it doesn't work. We're not there yet as a province, but we're on our way. We proved in Kitimat Village and the region that you can solve dependency, but, be, but it takes a tremendous amount of blood, sweat, and tears. The wounds I have in trying to bring change are still fresh, but it was worth it when I look at the success of people and communities and the strength of our society, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal alike. Is everything perfect? Of course not. There's no such thing as perfection, but it's a 180 degree turnaround from where we were 10 years ago. And ultimately, I don't want BC to end up where I came from. And that is why I still do what I do. Thank you. We have so many questions, um, and I'm gonna just address the, the first two presenters. Uh, Michael and, and Bob, there's a lot of questions about supply and like how would you make more housing? Clearly, uh, we haven't been very successful. Uh, is there any, give a thought of what's, what's in the way? Is it structure? Is it desire? Is it uh, willingness? What stands in the way of this? May you go form? first? Yeah. Is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> there's no reason why uh, the development on the corner of um, Maine and Kingsway took 13 years to get approval. That's just not acceptable. I, I remember David McClellan, who used to be the director of uh, 
planning and, and development for the city of Vancouver. And David said he couldn't understand any reason why you couldn't issue permits in a week. And with technology, uh, that's got to be easy to do if we want to do it. So uh, bureaucratic slowdown and, uh, adds cost, it adds uncertainty, and it slows down the supply. And the fact that we're very conservative, uh, in many ways reactionary, in developing new forms of housing. For example, in the city of Vancouver, you can't own a row house. Not allowed. You have to have a condominium. That's stupid. I mean, it's a trivial example, but there are all kinds of experiments all around the world that we could borrow from, probably go next door to Burnaby and learn a lot, and um, <laughs> see that we can expand the supply of housing, and we must. And until we expand the supply of housing, Prices can't come down. The beauty of having ridiculously high prices means government can extract not money for their tax base, but money for more housing. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Michael. Bob, do you have any thoughts? What uh, what you would you recommend? Oh, uh, I uh, I think we're locked into a tough problem for a long time. We've established the broad framework for the region. Uh, it 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 limits us dramatically. The truth is, I think we have to look to the interior, you know, and uh, Kamloops is, uh, is a great, great potential after too many generations of Bennetts focusing on Kelowna. But we have to, <laughs> we, we, uh, but uh, there's no doubt that by applied capacity of, of the people we have that are changing now both in the city and in the province, we're, we'll, we'll partly get there. But I think that's the reality of the tight space we're in. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I, I must uh, mention that we have three city councillors in the, in the uh, theater today, uh, Mike Clausen, uh, Mike Clausen, I believe there's uh, Lisa Dominato, and Lenny Joe, who were just elected in Vancouver, and uh, Rebecca Bly, sorry, four. Four, we almost have a... Uh, they could actually have a quorum. Uh, so <laughs> now, one thing. Uh, now, the next issue is the downtown east side. We got so many questions that are all all over the place. Um, but uh, I guess you know the, the one of the great concerns is people lying in the street right now, tonight. The rain. It's cold out there. So um, what can you give us a brief of what you would do first, Judy? Yeah. If I was the queen of Vancouver? Yes, if you were the queen of Vancouver. What would I do? You are the queen of Vancouver, yes. <laughs> what would you do? I would, I would um, move the programs out of some of the community centers, and I would use the, the community centers, especially the new ones, uh, as homeless shelters until we can get the housing built or development in Kamloops or, but what I know right now is that there is no vacant housing from the American border to Lana, mm. all the way up the coast. So mm. we can't, I think there are some vacancies in Princeton right now, <laughs> um, yeah, but right. there aren't in, Abbotsford, there are not, the, and, and I'm talking for the people that are doing the uh, care in nursing homes, there is no housing that they can afford. For the people that are working in the restaurants, mm. they can't hire restaurant staff in Vancouver because there's no housing for them. Um, Interesting how these problems are related then. And it's all housing. related. Uh, and I would go camp out on Mr. Trudeau's lawn in Ottawa and say, hey, guy, you know, uh, in 1990, you stopped funding your, your ilk, stopped funding the subsidized housing that was really the lifeblood of the cities. And there has been almost no housing, rental housing, subsidized or market developed in Canada in 30 years. Mm. Okay. Uh, Judy? And 
you know? Good. Do it. Just Good. Okay, do Scott, it. what about you? Okay. We're going to, we're a few minutes left. 30 seconds. <laughs> I'll give you more than 30 seconds. Regarding the downtown east side? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's just so much suffering. And uh, yeah, that suffering is, is, is a choice. There, there are ways to offer people options for, options for care, options for housing. Uh, and uh, I wish we could just get, get on with it. I mean, I, okay. I've, we've got hundreds of people on a wait list to get into our clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, six years into a public health emergency, and I think that's tragic. It's unbelievable. Julian, you're the king of Vancouver. So I'd, I'd do what we did. Um, I would uh, I'd strike up the band. We'd, um, We'd work with landlords and employers in the private sector, uh, groups that are uh, massively alienated. The resources that they bring to bear are, are vital to a solution. We would uh, secure, um, for starters, 500 units uh, scattered, that is the province would, would pay for long-term uh, leases, 500 units dispersed among the holdings of these landlords. Um, we'd look for units elsewhere in the province, too, because 85% of the people that we met who were homeless uh, chronically in the downtown east side 10 years before were not even in Metro Vancouver. Their stories, their life stories don't originate here, and they don't want them to end here either. And so we must have the capacity, but, but the thing we were able to do, Sam, was, was the same day, hey, you look like, you're our kind of people, we have a place in Marple, in Dunbar, and here in the, in, the, in, in the downtown east side. Are you interested in looking at any of them? And by the way, 100% of people chose outside the downtown east side. Amazing. 100%. I'm, I'm not saying it was an easy choice, but that's how they, that they voted with their feet and with their lives. We would do that. We would do what we've already done and, and have shown that it costs the same as leaving people homeless year over year. Thank you, Julia. Okay, thank you. And our last uh, issue, uh, one of the interesting question was that uh, uh, Chief Gibby and, uh, and Ellis, you both were in situations where there was a lot of potential financial uh, benefit with the city of Vancouver and also Kitimat being a really well-placed uh, pl for the uh, uh, you know, pipeline, etc. What about for First Nations, uh, Indian bands that don't, aren't well placed, what would you recommend for them? Become Squamish. Another Gibbyism. I think, you know, the, you know, there's a lot of First Nations who have no capacity whatsoever. You know, they have no office staff, they have no revenue. So to try and move them beyond where they're at, you know, they need, uh, I would say, an organization that, you know, is really uh, looking after their best interest. You know, and that would be a First Nations group who are versed in, in what you're just talking about. How do we get point A to point C? You know, the, well, it's B to go through, but uh, mm. <clears throat> there's, uh, there's a lot of good people out there, you know, uh, a lot of what I've done in my past, uh, uh, you know, I was a BC Aboriginal Fisheries Commission yes. chair uh, for the coastal group. I was on the uh, National Environmental Committee. So these are things that, you know, people put their time and effort into to help support those First Nations who don't have the ability to do that. And uh, I know my, I was talking about my cousin Harold a little bit earlier, but the organization that he is uh, the chairman of, uh, I believe he's a chair, <clears throat> is a truly an outstanding organization that is there to support the needs of First Nations people. Thank you. First Nations Fiscal Management Board. I think I got it right. Ellis. I just got back from Ottawa where I actually uh, talked about uh, the reconciliation task force that they're proposing to set up. My daughter watched it. My youngest daughter is getting politically involved and she's trying to understand uh, the nature of native problems in Canada. So 
right after the panel, she texted me, what do you think that should be done for indigenous communities who aren't as lucky as us to be situated for resource development and that rely on the Indian government policies? Exactly the same question. And I've been asked this question for years. And this is my answer, all in text, by the way. Uh, that question should be first posed to our leaders. On the other hand, we as Heisla invited our neighbors who weren't as lucky to gain contracts in our territory for forestry, for LNG, and for mining under one condition. They had to drop their opposition to the economy. A lot of these First Nations didn't and still don't have anything in terms of opportunities, so they try to encroach on neighboring projects for a piece of the pie, and all they're trying to do is resolve poverty. That's it. As for bands that have nothing, on a case-by-case -case basis, an assessment has to be done to see what's possible. But at the end of the day, I advise natives that in either case, you have to know what you want. If you can't clearly define what you want, it won't matter if you have opportunity or not. Huh. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the public salon. I have so many questions that have just been put on my lap. Uh, we're going to have time in the lobby, so I encourage you to meet some of our speakers. I have so much respect for every single one on this stage. Please thank them for giving their time tonight. The public salon continues in the lobby. See you there. Thank you. <laughs>